Hey, welcome once again to another another episode or well, I don't know if you want to call it an episode or maybe just a message, you know. Another message coming live. Well, not really live either, but well, this is more of a recording. Well, yes, it is a recording. Who am I kidding, right? But this is once again from my room. Great. Um well, a lot has happened. A lot of things have been happening in between the last time you saw me and this this time. But, you know, we've been talking about some really good topics, some really hot topics in our series on the names of God. Wonderful stuff, and I hope you didn't miss any of that. But if in case you did, well, I'm glad that Facebook has its own option to go ahead and go back to our live broadcasts. We certainly had a good message last week with uh, Pastor John talking about how God is our Elohim or our living God. And, you know, how this truth was given to us. As an exclamation point by God, he showed that he was living. And how do we know that he's living? Well, we see it none in nothing less than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now I'm wondering, or rather, I'm I'm led to recall, rather, one of these wonderful movies that came out during the 2000s or the first decade of 2000. Was it 2000? Or maybe sometime earlier than that anyway. But if you guys remember the movie called The Mummy, there was this one scene where our protagonist, Mr. O'Connell, was defending against countless hordes of desert tribemen as they were looking for the mummy. And he had a friend, well, not really much of a friend, but his name was Benny, and he was right there beside him with his, with his gun trained as well, against these countless hordes of horsemen, you know, with their, with their um, swords and whatnot. One, one thing that struck me with this is that when O'Connell was asking Benny, are you with me on this? Are you with me on this? I mean, do you have my back? And the one thing that um, Benny says is, and you know, I'm gonna try to murder his, uh, his line here where he says, oh, your strength gives me strength. <laughs> but the thing about it is, I'm remembering that because it has some truth in the sense that Christ's life gives us life. And he does, he does not just give us life, but He is our life. Let's pray together as we continue this message. Heavenly Father, thank You so much for this time. Thank You so much, Lord Jesus Christ, for the opportunity to speak to one in a thousand people through the magic and the technology of video. I'm so thankful, Lord Jesus Christ, that You reach out to our brothers and sisters today and to myself, O Heavenly Father, with this message of peace, that You are our peace. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask for open eyes and open ears and open hearts, O Heavenly Father, especially mine, as you continue to go ahead and share this message of truth about you being our shalom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, as we talk about how God is our life and God is our, well, as we talk about how God is our living God and our Elohim, and as how His life is our life and He gives us life, well, we can also say in the same regard that God's light gives us light. And He clarifies with this light. I mean, because of this light, we are clarified, we are directed, and we are secured. He's the living Word. I mean, Christ is... We, we talk a whole lot about in the Psalms about how the Word is a lamp upon our feet and a light unto our path. But guess what? Now because of Christ's finished work, Christ Himself is the living Word. He is Himself the literal lamp upon our feet. And He is the light unto our path, wherever we are, whatever we are doing, no matter how dark it seems to get. And He is present. He is faithful. And here's, here's what's wonderful about it. His light is independent of anything that I'm feeling or anything that I'm seeing. Of course, He looks at us. And he, he knows what we are going through. He knows what we are feeling. He knows what we're going through at any given moment. But however we react or however, however we respond to everything that's happening in us and around us does not affect how faithful and how true our God is. How faithful and how true our Christ is. So He's independent of these feelings that we have. Independent of everything that we may say or do. But on the, on the other hand, His grace and His light are just that amazing that they are able to, to, to be so pervasive towards us. I mean pervasive in the sense that 
it affects us. It inspires us. Christ light, it, it leaves us in awe and wonder. And this is the force and the power behind our movements, behind, behind the words that we say, and the, and the thoughts that we have. And that's just such a beautiful thing. He is the Prince of Peace. Christ is not just a living word. He is not just the light upon our, uh, not just the light upon our path, unto our path, and the la- not just a lamp on, upon our feet. But, I mean, more than anything, and the theme of this, this message that we're talking about today is that we can also say that Christ is our peace. In fact, the prophet Isaiah says that not only is he peace, but he is the prince of peace, the authority over peace. He is, the spe- he is this peace, I'm sorry, he is this peace that spoke to the wind and the waves, saying, peace be still, in such a calm and, and, calm and cool manner. You could imagine, he could go ahead and speak so cool, so smooth, even in spite of everyone around him being so scared, and even screaming at him, don't you care that we're going to die? Well, to that he goes ahead and says, well, <laughs> well, he doesn't say that, he doesn't go that far, but he says, peace be still. And on the other hand, guess what? He's the one who was full of emotion, but he is the same peace. The same peace that said, peace be still, is the same peace that amidst everyone around him, mourning and weeping and being so sad and crying, he responds by saying, Lazarus, come forth. The same peace that speaks, peace be still, is the same peace that speaks, Lazarus, come forth. He's the peace that spoke calmly when the, when, when the Roman, well, when the soldiers, unsure if Roman or Jewish, you can clarify with me on that, but when the soldiers grabbed Jesus and dragged him out of the Garden of Gethsemane in front of the aggressive Sanhedrin, And as they proceeded to mock him and ridicule him and beat him and slap him, tear out his beard and all that, he was in peace. That's the peace that continued to stand. And when he was asked the question of what he was or who he thought he was, he calmly said that he is the Son of God. In peace. But yet, this is the the same peace that without hesitation proceeded to turn over tables and turn over the the cages of these sacrificial animals that they were all selling and with these all these money changers that were in front of the temple in in a, in a sense he was saying how dare you cheapen the grace of god how dare you take the grace of god put it into your level and make money out of it but i would like to believe that in that same time He was also at peace in the sense that he knew what he was doing and he didn't care about any repercussions. This is the same peace, the same peace that spoke out saying that he was the son of God before the Sanhedrin is the same peace that tore over tables and turned over tables. We keep on going here. I mean, he's the peace that was in Daniel in the lion's den. He's the same peace that he was the same peace that was with Daniel in the lion's den in the sense that Daniel could have felt all, all sorts of fear. Death facing him in the face, in the face, I mean, in the, in the form of so many lions right before him. But still, Christ in him was his peace. Christ was also the peace in David when he was facing Goliath, Goliath in full ba- battle armor. But David was there in his, and in peace, I would like to believe, in peace and his power. He approached David, I mean, he, David approached Goliath and went ahead and said, You come to me with a sword and an armor and shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord and he will give me victory. No hesitations, no turning back, no, no fear or nothing. So you see, this peace is all about, I mean, this peace is not just a meek, silent peace, but this is a peace that demonstrates power, my brothers and sisters. I could keep on going here, you know, I mean, Christ is a peace that is as a flame in a lamp, providing us with safety. We can feel safe in peace. But Christ is also the the, the flame, as he is a candlelight that gives us safety and light in the darkness, even in brownouts. 
This is the same Christ that serves as a flame, consuming or supposedly consuming a bush, but never consuming it. But his presence as a fire upon the bush is felt. So you see, so you see Christ demonstrates his power by his peace. And Christ demonstrates his peace by his power. How beautiful, how beautiful Christ is. He shows indeed that he is the Prince of Peace, the authority over peace, the one who has peace and is peace. I really need a haircut. <laughs> I'm sorry. Now for the majority of us who've been reading our Bible or have probably been listening to the stories of Gideon back in the day, well, um, we're told of Gideon and his glorious victory over the Midianites. And this was no small feat because the Midianites were very great in number. Um, but here's the thing, this, our story with regards to Jehovah Shalom comes even before that. You see, Gideon, much like the other Israelites at the time, were in fear of the Midianites. They were so scared of them because these Midianites, they would go ahead and go and invade when they knew that there was a harvest in the, Israel, in the land of Israel. The Midianites would go ahead and swoop over and just steal all the grain and all the food that they've been gathering all that time leaving them with nothing. I mean, they would go ahead and harvest and the Midianites would take the food from them. So Gideon was in a wine press. Um, that's, I guess, like a, like a hole in the ground or, well, I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't really know, but a wine press. A wine press was just a hidden, uh, a location where you can hide. And Gideon was in the wine press and he was threshing wheat, he was processing grain in the wine press, when the angel of the Lord went ahead and appeared before him and told him that the Lord is with him. And here's the thing, Gideon at the time, in fear, operating in fear, knew that this was an angel of the Lord representing God Almighty. But Gideon, even right then and there, he could have been awed by his presence, but he went ahead and said things like, God, well, if the Lord is with me, then why are the Midianites just plain jerks to us? Why, why, are they, why are they like this to us? Why, and why are we being so oppressed? If you are for us, I don't really see it right now. And to this, the angel of the Lord just continued to be really patient with Gideon and said, well, literally he said, well, just go ahead and uh, give me an offering and I'll, I'll go ahead and demonstrate what's going on here. So Gideon, he, will, he goes ahead and gets a goat. And he, uh, he slaughters it, makes a broth out of it too. And, you know, he makes a stew. I love Mediterranean food, but anyway, I mean, that's beyond the point. Ugh. Anyway, uh, he makes a stew, bread, everything. And the angel of the Lord tells him, Hey, why don't you put that, put that meat on a stone, put the bread on top of it, and pour the broth over it. And the angel of the Lord proceeded to take his rod and struck with the with the with the tip of his rod, he struck the offering, and the, the whole thing just blew up in flames. And you would think that Gideon would re respond by saying, "Whoa! Now, okay, now I know that the Lord is with me." Well, no, he didn't. He he was more scared of his presence because, just like Peter was ashamed after a miracle, Gideon was also ashamed in the sense that he was in the presence of holiness and he was fearful that he would die. But the angel of the Lord, full of grace, and I want us to remember these words as we continue down this road, he goes ahead and tells Gideon three things, or two things when you think about it. Peace be with you. Do not fear. You will not die. For Gideon was afraid he would die because he was in the presence of holiness. And unholiness in the presence of holiness could not stand and would just go ahead and die and fade away. But here comes Jesus in the form of the angel of the Lord saying, Peace be with you. Do not fear. You will not die. That's said in Judges chapter 6 verse 23, just in case you needed a reference. And these are his words. In fact, let's go ahead and take that story out of the way for a moment. And let's go ahead and focus on those words for now. Peace be with you. Do not fear. You will not die. And I believe these are words for us right here and now at this moment. What with, you know, the Lebanon bomb explosions, with uh, 
with things happening in our country and out of our country, with things happening in the United States and everything going on around this world, I say to each and every one of us today that the Lord speaks to us and He says, Peace be with you. Do not fear. You will not die. These are His words in the midst that all, of all that we see in our eyes. Back here in the Philippines, here in the Philippines, we're seeing all sorts of checkpoints on the road. We're seeing all sorts of face masks in all forms and colors. But in the face of everything that we see in here, we say, Peace be with you. Do not fear. You will not die. In the face of everything that we do not just see with our own eyes, but we see on our computer screens and our phone screens, all the news that's being thrown at us, whether it be fake news or facts, I mean, all of it just directs us to fear. And in the face of all this fear that the world would have us demand to think, we say, and Christ says, peace be with you. Do not fear. You will not die. These are the words. These are the words. And you would think that you would think that religion would have us feeling all sorts of better things. But there's just such an insidious move in religion going on nowadays where we would go ahead and not stand in, in power and peace. But we would be in the same sort of fear because people would, I mean, lots of messages coming out these days where they go ahead and say, well, guess what, you know, these are the signs of our times and the world's going to end soon. And you got to make sure that you're doing your good, your bestest best. Because Christ may come back at any time, and if He catches you doing anything bad, oh, you're going to be in trouble. But, you know, it's just another flavor of fear. And in the face of that fear, I go ahead and say, peace be with you, do not fear, you will not die. And friends, notice that He says, peace be with you. He does not say, have peace. He does not say, I give you peace. But He says, peace be with you. He speaks of peace as if it was a living entity. It is more than just a possession. Peace is more than just a feeling or an emotion that would have us feeling good inside. No, peace is a living entity and that entity is Christ. Jesus Christ is with us. Therefore, peace is with us. Peace be with you. And he says, do not fear. He speaks. He speaks of fear, not as something. He does not speak of fear and peace at the same level, but he speaks of fear as one of these actions. He speaks of fear as one of these emotions. Because we cannot go ahead and say, do not fear, and shove it all on, on, onto the side. No. Here's the thing. Fear is something that is present and it's certainly an option for each and every one of us. And it's definitely an option that the majority of the world is taking right now. But to us in Christ, my brothers and sisters, fear is a mere choice, an option. We can choose to fear. But instead, let us understand that peace is with us. You see, we can, it's not that we deny that there is fear. There is fear. Fear is happening. But we're not about to go ahead and be part of the rest of the world in mongering and, and, and just promoting fear. No. The first line, the first words of the line says, peace be with you. And that's what we are communicating right now. Why do, and here's the thing, why do we say do not fear? Because God says you will not die. Well, we just had Pastor Oscar die. Well, my dad. He died. No matter, how, no matter how many times we prayed or declared that he would be healed of cancer, he died. How would we say that you will not die? My brothers and sisters, you have to understand that the death that we are speaking of here goes far beyond the death that we have of our physical bodies. Yes, uh, bodies of our Pastor Oscar, the bodies of my father, and all those who have gone before us are gone. They're buried in the ground, rendered into ash. And they will stay that way, or probably not. But the thing about it is, you have to understand that the death that has been taken away from us is the death that matters, which is the death that we would suffer for all eternity. That has been taken away from us. This is why Jesus says that He is the resurrection and the life. And though our bodies may perish, we will live forever. You have to understand, that being said, that the life that we have is not just a life that we have in this present life, but a life that goes far beyond borders, far beyond time, and far beyond anything that we can ever think or feel. 
we have eternal life and that eternal life is not just when we pass away what not just when our bodies pass away but that eternal life is here and now this is the confidence behind me saying that you will not die this is the confidence our Christ's victory over death and the grave and sin our Christ's victory is the only basis of my confidence in saying for each and every one of us that Christ says peace be with you you will not die therefore do not fear I kind of jumbled it up there just for you guys to stay on your toes but that's what it is guys you know here, here we are, we're, we're thinking of all sorts of reasons for us to fear. And no doubt, what with all this going on in our lives, right now in this particular moment, in this year 2020, which was supposed to be a beautiful year, which is in sense still a beautiful year because we still see Christ's finished work manifesting in so many more ways than we ever expected. The world likes to, likes to go ahead and call, the world likes to go ahead and give us all sorts of complications but the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is shown ever so much simpler as the world gets more complicated and it says to each and every one of us today I am your provision I am your life I am your breath I am your healing I am your victory and because of this victory you can also say that I am your peace this is Jesus guys I mean, Christ, Christ went ahead and said, peace be with you. He said, peace be with you to, he, he said, peace be still in the face of the storm. And when he laid down his life and when he rose again from the dead, the same Jesus came to Thomas, Thomas, one of the apostles. He came to Thomas and showed the holes on his hands and on his side forever eternal testimonies of his eternal victory over sin and death and it's because of this that Thomas had peace and he said what we love to say my Lord and my God as a response to Christ's victory as a response to Christ's life as a response to Christ's true resurrection Thomas went ahead and said my Lord and my God and he went on to be one of the apostles in spreading the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ to countless generations that even the work of Thomas is seen in each and every one of us nowadays. And it doesn't stop there. Because the original person who this was spoken to, Gideon, when the angel of the Lord spoke to Gideon, and when he said, peace to you, do not fear, you will not die. Immediately after that, in Judges chapter 3, verse 24, is where Gideon built an altar and he called it Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is peace. My brothers and sisters, I am not talking about a peace that keeps us docile and pacifist. But at the same time, I'm not talking about a peace that, that would have us go without with reckless abandon this is a peace that is beyond understanding this is a peace that is, is beyond anything we, we could ever imagine in the sense that it leaves us in wonder where once we were operating from fear now we operate from peace and this peace is the power that goes beyond all understanding there was a time in my life when i was back in college i think maybe back in college or maybe when i was starting to work that I um, well, I was thinking about G I, mean, I was thinking about this whole Christianity movement and how it really meant to me. I was raised an Anglican, as some of you know, and uh, well, some of it didn't really sit right with me. And I used well, we were in ROTC back in the day, which gave us an excuse not to go to church. You know, I would go ahead and tell my dad, "Oh, I'm sorry, Dad, I can't go to church with you. I have ROTC." And it was during these moments that I kind of missed church, but at the same time I was thinking to myself, well, I might just go ahead and go by by just reading my Bible and, you know, I mean, I know God is God and, you know, I mean, now that I think about it, I was a little bit agnostic at the time. But one of the things that, that uh, came to me during this time was a thought in my head saying, why bother doing anything at all? 
why bother doing anything at, at all? If Christ is going to come back, and if he's going to save us anyway, and everything is going to be made new, what's the use of, you know, what's the use of even trying? What's the use of, you know, making money? What's the use of having a family? What's the use of, uh, you know, saving the world? If Christ is all going to resolve it anyway. Fast forward to when, well, I had a quarrel with my mom just a couple of days ago. And uh, we were, long story short, we were, we were having some sort of, we were having some differences in how we were thinking and how we were approaching Christ. And God bless her soul, because my mom loves me in the sense that she would go ahead and speak straight to my face. And she spoke, she definitely, definitely spoke to me by saying, so what are you going to do? I mean, it's like, I mean, it's just, are we just going to have to, I mean, are you telling me that we don't have to do anything at all and we can just sit down and wait for the Lord Jesus Christ to come? The answer to these two questions that I've had back in the past and in the recent past, well, it's really just about us celebrating Christ, if we're not finding anything to do, or if we're having a hard time to do, if we know what we need to do, and if we're having a hard time being motivated to do what we need to do, we need to go back and remember. Because that's what Peter said. Peter said that if, if any of these things, love, self-control, um, brotherhood, or brotherly love, or if any of these things are not found in you, Peter was straightforward in saying that you have forgotten the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. My brothers and sisters, we have to understand that this isn't just feel-good theology. This isn't just feel-good philosophy. This isn't just thoughts that we want to go ahead and make you believe. We personally believe in the Good News Community Church that this is something that of of utmost importance because it changed our lives and we believe that it could change your lives as well. Like in the sense of peace, my brothers and sisters, I speak of peace and I speak of Christ being our Jehovah Shalom only because it has set me free of the fear that, that, that seems to be conquering and dominating each and every one of us. And it is my prayer that we all understand it is our prayer it is our prayer in this church not just my prayer but our prayer as a church that we would see Christ in our own personal ways and we would understand the, the many things that he is for us and more than anything else guys he is peace that goes beyond all understanding whatever you're going through he remains to be our peace we can look at things, we can, we can have the devil steal, kill, and destroy literally everything from us. But we can have peace in understanding that the Lord has come and He gives us life and life everlasting. And we can have peace. It's not just about us being strong in the face of all sorts of weakness. But guys, this is a peace that also keeps us in place even though we're winning. This is a peace that is present to us whether we are losing or winning. So, you know, whether we have zero pesos in our account or whether we have 10,000 billion gajillion pesos in our account, we would not be swayed by the money, but we would have peace knowing that the Lord is our provider in the lack or in the plenty. That's all this peace is, guys. This peace causes us to have a perspective of this world that, that makes us understand the world in a such a, a greater perspective. And it's our prayer. It's, it's our sins, my sincere prayer that we would all have this peace. I'm thankful that you spent this time with me today. Always remember that Christ is who He says He is. As God says, well, let me rephrase that. God says He is who he says he is and I believe that because I know Christ is in all of it he is our Jehovah Jireh he is our Yahweh Christ is our Jehovah Rapha Christ is our Jehovah Nisi Christ is our Elohim he is the Elohim of all Elohims and guys as we continue down this series Christ is our Jehovah Shalom and father we thank you so much 
that you are with us. You never leave us nor forsake us. You are the peace that goes beyond all understanding. And I pray and I declare, O oh Heavenly Father, that whatever is causing my brothers and sisters to fear at this present moment, that you would speak to their fear saying, Peace and be still. That whatever, whatever is rattling our brothers and sisters at this moment that is leading them to being indecisive and fearful, you are the peace that speaks to them saying that you would never leave them nor forsake them no matter what they're going through, no matter what they're seeing. I pray and I declare, O Lord Jesus Christ, that you would be with them. You would be with each and every one of us, especially in these hours, especially in this season of fear and darkness. You would continue to be our light. And more importantly, yes, you would continue to be our fear. We love you, but we thank you so much that you loved us first. Continue to minister to us. Thank you, O Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a good week, everyone. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious upon you. The Lord lift His countenance upon you and give you His shalom. In Jesus' name.